Okay, students, welcome to another session. And today I'm real excited because we have Dr. Howie de Blasi, who's going to talk to us about his fandom with Disney um, and also his background with his love of Disney, but his background with um, education and educational technology and kind of how that has led him into doing some pretty interesting things throughout his career um, and today. And so without me talking much more, I want to introduce Dr. Howie and welcome to the class and to the show. If you could give us a background of um, how you got introduced to Disney, how your interest and love of Disney grew um, and take us up to today. Thank you. Let me do a fist bump out to <laughs> everybody. Well, you know, it, I, I really appreciate this. Uh, I've really been looking forward to it. And the amazing thing for me was I was not a very good student in high school. I, I saw, you know, I was going to go in the Army. This is back in uh, 1958, 59, and 60. And then Vietnam War started. But in high school, my passion was a shop class. And Art Decker was my teacher. And in 1958, uh, and I took it all the way through high school. He said, do you know about uh, Disneyland that's being built? He says, it's built now, it's in 55 and it was open. I said, no, what is that? So he introduced me to it and said, you need to go look at these things up in an encyclopedia at that time. We didn't have all the electronic things at the time. And I thought, this is really cool. And so all the way through high school, I, uh, you know, was getting background and research, and I lived in uh, Florida at the time, and I knew I couldn't get out to the LA Anaheim area to do it. But uh, after I graduated, then I went on to Florida State University uh, with a major because of Art Decker. He said, "What are you going to do with your life?" I said, "I'm going to the army. I'm going to shoot a gun." And he says, "No." He says, "You need to be a teacher." He says, "You need to take your passion." of how much you enjoy doing this class and being an industrial arts teacher. That's what they referred to it at the time. And so I went to Florida State and did that. After I graduated in 19, excuse me, 64, my best buddy, Denny Prisk and I said, let's do a tour around Florida. And um, this, at this period in time, there were rumors about not Disney per se, but somebody was buying all this land up in Florida. And I started researching that and didn't find anything out till uh, about a year later. And they announced the Disney World was going to be built. Now, now I really got excited because um, living in Florida, I had just gotten married in uh, 65 and decided uh, we, we're going to go there. And so we said, well, let's figure out a way to get there. Well, uh, what happened was we actually moved to Arizona because of an opportunity, a teaching opportunity to start a new uh, vocational education program um, in, uh, in Arizona. And I kept reading all these things about Disney and just getting so stoked. And I told my wife, uh, we had uh, two kids by that time. I said, let's go to Disneyland. We're, we're only five hours away. So we planned a trip with the kids and one was uh, three, the other one was five. And my wife says, I don't want to do this with a baby and a stroller and doing all those kind of things. And I said, no, no, we're going to do it. I was done. I walked around with stargazing, looking at the things. I had read about the Matterhorn. I had found blueprints of how they made the Matterhorn. And I really got into the story behind the attractions, which that just for me just sparked a whole new interest that I was getting uh, information about this attraction, how it was made, who the people were, and started coming in contact with some different Imagineers at that time, never knowing what it was going to lead to with PD Magic, which we'll talk about. So we did that uh, in 71. And then uh, uh, the next series of things and events that happened, uh, we ended up, I got an offer uh, to uh, uh, go to Colorado, but right after in 1984, 
I got an offer to open a computer business. And with that uh, provided, a, a, this was at the time when we had Apple IIs and the very basic computers that were there. Um, we had things that had 64K of memory. And that was a big deal at that time in there. Um, I was very fortunate to be teaching computer science in the Voc Ed program and taught coding to the different kids. And four kids were able to really learn how to code. And we put a little bit of Disney into it. We did a couple of games. These were on cassettes on the pet computer. And it's amazing to me today, I had kids that were back in 1984 and 85 and 86 that were making two to $3,000 a month in programming. And that led me to doing more research and things. And then an offer came uh, to move to, to Colorado. And with that, it was an opportunity to become the chief information officer. Now, during those 20 years that I was in education, um, I was very fortunate with two principals to say, whatever you need, just tell me. We were doing things that were so far ahead of time. We were doing STEM and those type of programs back in 1975 to 1984. And I just loved being able to do that. In my computer science lab, I had a whole electronics lab to learn about electronics, but we had a full color TV studio where we recorded videos. We recorded the video football games, basketball. We also did lots of other activities that were on campus. Um, we had a contract with the cable company. These kids were actually recording and doing the broadcast. And many of them went on to be in that area in sports broadcasting, a lot of different areas because everybody was just, they couldn't believe that these were high school kids that were doing that. And I got so much enjoyment out of that and I really struggled with uh, going to Durango um, and going to be in a job as a chief information officer versus going to teaching. But the same thing happened when I got to Durango. The finance director says, and the, and the superintendent says, we want the best vocational education program in the state of Colorado. I said, well, it's gonna take some money. And they never said no. And we did the same thing there but what really happened was just some pixie dust magic. Uh, this is at the time that FETC in Florida, uh, the Florida Educational Technology Conference was starting to do their conferences. And I went to the superintendent and said, I would like to go there and tell them about our school district. And she said, well, how much is this gonna cost? And then she said, no, no, don't worry about that, just go. Every year that I was there for the 18 years, I got to go back to Orlando and speak to like-minded teachers to show them what we were doing. But every single time there was a Disney workshop in some way or form that was in there. One would be on storytelling. One would be on designing the theme park attraction. Another one would be uh, finding some Disney magic. In other words, all the hidden magic that's in there, why they do that. One was on hidden Mickeys. And in those 17, 18 years that I did that, that passion just started growing. And I was getting close to retirement. And my wife said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I, I really don't know. I really like the job. But, um, you know, we can retire at a, at a really good uh, salary. And with social, uh, social security, we can do anything we want. Well, we decided that it would be great to travel around the world. And for about eight years, literally went around the world. But many times it was because of Walt, of places that I went to. A, a quick example is Copenhagen. And I don't know if, if you've ever been there, but the uh, Tripoli Gardens, that was one of the places that Walt Disney went. And he just came away with all kinds of ideas. I walk into Tripoli Gardens and I look at this attraction that is horses that you get on and it goes around on a cylinder and they move up and down, but there's a guy that's 
manually pushing the things to move them up and down. And I'm thinking, Dumbo, he just overdid it and went into Dumbo. And you walk all the way through there. And I would encourage any of your students or anybody that's going to listen to this to somehow, there's a lot of cruises that go out of there. That's why we were there, but we came in four days early. Absolutely just magic in walking around there. And you could see the beauty of the gardens and things, the things that Walt did, and so many ideas that he got from that. And then even there, the storytelling piece. So we went through that period of time. And um, then, and you stop me if I'm going too far here or, or saying too much. I'm just trying oh, no, to get that's fine. up to date. Retirement came and we did those traveling. And then uh, a friend of mine that I knew um, said, would you like to work for me and teach different classes uh, college classes that are for credit uh, that teachers use for certification. And I said, yeah, but is it okay if I do some Disney things? He said, sure. So for seven years, Alan November uh, sent me literally around the country in doing that. And we just took the same things that we did in Durango and built them into college courses. So uh, when that was kind of coming to the end, I thought, well, gee, I can just go ahead and continue this. And I continued that for another 10 years of traveling the circuit as a educational technology representative. Uh, we had, there were about 10 of us that traveled around and I got to see many parts of the country, many tech things that were going on. And I was all, always able to bring in Disney in some way or form. And I was really amazed because I started about two years into it, I started doing a workshop uh, that was and now this is uh, the new book that will be out in March and it's called Imagineering Classrooms and what it was was designing the theme park attraction. I took them in a one day class three hours in the morning three in the afternoon through every one of the steps that Disney did to build an attraction but they had to come up with a new attraction. They had to put all the pieces together. They had to do the blue sky. They had to make a presentation. They had to make a model and they put all those things together. Then they had to do a five minute presentation at the end of the workshop. And then I gave gift cards off for that. That thing was so popular, they sold it out in most cases for one or two days. And then at sometimes I was doing actually two of those at the conferences. From that, when I stopped doing that about six years ago, uh, I came up with the idea of on Twitter of doing some different things with Disney. And a number of things that have come out of that in the last six years has been our podcast that we do, My Disney Class Podcast with Ryan Beckman. And you've been on there two times. And that really got us excited because we were getting several thousand downloads every month. And we were just, we were shocked. We're now in the sixth year in doing that and talking about different things and having guests on the show. So we did the podcast. Um, I, I really, in 19, let's see, that'd be 15 years ago, uh, Disney has something called the Disney Vacation Club. Well, we just love traveling. Disney has these uh, places around the world. So we bought one condo and you use it at a park and you can go anytime that you want to after you've paid your fees. And then we bought a second one because we enjoyed it so much. Um, then we developed the website, mydisneyclass.com, and that's got information about different programs that we've done. And then uh, three years ago, we came up with an idea uh, that was a, a, a spin-off of a class we did at Buena Vista, University, at Buena Vista University with Jerry Johnson. And that was a Disney class in doing Disney assignments. Everything you can think of Disney, that was a Disney class for graduate credit. That was a huge hit. And part of that was going to be a uh, trip to Walt Disney World. Well, the funding didn't work out on that, but Ryan and I said, well, let's just do this on our own, which we did. We, um, it's a five day uh, trip and the students meet us there. And we basically take them through the parks. We, they stay on property. We bring in Steve Elkhorn, who, who was the Imagineer who did the American Adventure. Uh, Brian Collins, who was partnered with us, is, was a former Disney Imagineer. Jeff Dixon, who's a Disney author. Um, many, many Disney uh, Imagineers and also people that have done uh, many uh, books. Jim Corcus is another one that we've had on there. 
So lots of different people. And we put that together and we had uh, 11 people on that first trip and they were just absolutely amazed. We were totally immersed from eight o'clock in the morning until 12 o'clock. We walked them down Main Street and gave them the history of why the windows are there, why different things are done, why the windows are so low, different people that are in the parks. And then we did all four parks that way and uh, immersed them in showing them how to bring that into the classroom. So what we had were 10 cohorts who went back to their schools and were so excited they started teaching the class. And there's hundreds of schools now doing our PD magic session and doing the things online with, with it. So that kind of brings you up to the day um, of, what, uh, of everything in background and so on what we're doing. And we're, the, the COVID has hit us pretty hard where we had to cancel the one for this year. And we're starting to put the program together for the next session that will go on. Uh, we'll announce things um, on our uh, web page uh, for dates and things. So I'm sorry that that took a number of minutes to do that, but that kind of brings you up to date. Thanks for all that. And, and, and don't worry about taking a number of minutes. Uh, that, that's perfectly fine. I think because as we were talking about before we started recording, um, I, I have the background I do because Figment is a very important character to me, Figment and the Dreamfinder, because of what they represent and uh, representing that imagination and how you um, and Ryan have been able to use imagination uh, and kind of tap into people's imagination when through the PD magic and throughout your career, how you've been able to do that. Um, and I also mentioned to you that we, we typically will kind of sometimes go off on tangents based on the introduction and everything. Um, and so a few things you mentioned makes me want to go off on a tangent. Um, you said you, when you were growing up in Florida, um, that's when the announcement, that's when the rumors, the rumor mill was running and then led to the announcement uh, that Walt Disney World was opening and led to you doing some research on that on your own. Could you give us a little more kind of insight to what, to what you were doing sort of from that perspective that you just really, really enjoyed the company? Um, and then were you, when, I guess, when did you move from Florida? Um, was it before the park was open or after? Um, well, let me, let me start with one. I'm going to add one thing and then I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, all of this happened because of my dad and my grandfather. My grandfather immigrated from Italy. He was a machinist and he immigrated in the early 1900s. And he built a machine shop in his basement. My dad had his own business. He had three of them. And I spent a lot of time at my grandfather's. He had me downstairs in that workshop, building things, making things with my hand. Little did I know how it would lead to the industrial arts classes and woodworking and things that I was taking. And my dad was always the same way in that he was always building something, selling a house, buying a cottage, remodeling it and having me help him. So I learned how to do a lot of the, uh, the construction things. So we were in... Uh, in Florida um, from 1969 to 1991, uh, I believe it was, 92, uh, is when we moved into uh, uh, Colorado. But all of those things, what happened while I was, was doing each one of those things and doing the research, it just started with a little spark from, from Art Decker. And I thought, well, what, who is this guy? Well, I, I went to libraries anywhere I could getting things on Walt Disney, and there were not a lot of books. There were some that were out there, but I read of, of what he did and all of the different ideas that he'd had, and, at, and then I started reading about an, audio animatronics, and I think this is where my love of electronics came from. 
uh, reading about the Lincoln and the 1964 World's Fair. Uh, 64 is when I graduated from college, but I heard all about this thing they were doing. And again, we didn't have a whole lot of electronic things, uh, you know, like the internet and that they were just getting started at that point in time. But of hearing of audio animatronics and see how they worked and seeing how the first little bird was done and what Walt did, then I'd go back and get articles. Uh, and again, a lot of these things were coming from encyclopedias or I'd go to the school, the college library, and uh, there were some research and things that were done. Uh, and, and as we were sharing before, I mean, that even led to, I got my master's at uh, Northern Arizona University, and that was pretty much pure industrial arts vocational education. But uh, when I did my master's at Western, I mean, my uh, doctorate at Western Pacific, um, I thought, you know, I'm going to tie this into Disney in some way. And the way the whole Disney piece pieced together is Disney, I was, when I was doing the research, and at that time, corresponding by mail with some Imagineers, uh, they were telling me of how things were done with laser discs, how they were able to actually record things on there, and the audio tracks would be on the laser disc. The control of audio animatronics was on the laser disc. And that just fascinated me. So I got a lot of information on that. So it was just each year building on some things. And then when we found out that uh, Disney World was going to be in Florida, we said, well, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So um, the time period was flowing along that we're still living in Arizona and went to Disneyland, as I said, and they didn't have California Adventure at that time. But we went a number of times there and I just got lots of ideas. And I really started thinking about how would I design an attraction? What attraction would it be? How would it draw people in? How would it work? What's the story behind it? never realizing that foundation was going to come many years later into PD Magic. So that, that's kind of what happened. And, and then, then the internet started coming in and it made it so much. It was, all of it was text when it first began. And it was easier because some databases and things were out there. I was able to get a lot more information and it just, it just fed the fire. Just mm -hmm. learning more and more about Walt and what he did. Uh, I would follow Imagineers and attractions they built. And every time there'd be a new attraction come out, it was some new technology that Walt was aware of that he did. So that's kind of how that happened. And so, because we, we spend a good amount of time in the class talking about the parks and talking about different attractions. And we'll get into some of the, the background of the attractions, and but more so the background of kind of what the vision was for the parks and um, what the vision was, you know, for Disneyland and, and, and telling these stories that people had seen on the screen, the vision for Epcot and being this, the original vision of being this kind of working city. Um, and then what it turned into the park being a place of ideas for people to come and get ideas and take them out to their communities. Um, kind of like what, what you are doing with PD Magic where you give them the ideas and then people take it out and they, they use your ideas and um, their schools as well. But we, so we, we spend a good amount of time talking on the parks, but you touched on something that I think is really interesting for the students and people watching or listening. Um, the idea of everything that goes into an attraction. And with your background, um, could you just give us a little bit of glimpse of what goes into creating an attraction like during the pandemic when when everyone was at home and we were doing preschool at home uh me and my two boys uh what, they had two kind of mock assignments where they created an attraction and that they designed an attraction based off of what their favorite show or what their favorite movie was um but i don't think when people go to the parks they see every or they they are able to see everything that goes into those attractions. So could you just give us a little bit of glimpse as to what the technology, the storytelling, everything that has to go into an attraction um, so that we enjoy it when we go to one of the parks? Sure, love to. In fact, that's a perfect segue of the book that's coming out. 
uh, Imagine Imagineering classroom. But what I wanted to make sure of, because sometimes we get some kickback and people say, oh, God, and they're rolling their eyes. Here comes the Disney. Here comes Dr. Disney again. He's going to talk about the same old thing. But what happened was when I realized how popular the workshops were, and that's only six hours. Normally, this is a semester long course that the, the teachers do in school, but I made sure they understand, understood project based learning in STEM. That was the key to that. So the first few things that we go through in the book and with the students is what is project-based learning? What is STEM and how does that all work into it? How does the science, the math, the engineering, the technology, all those people, uh, things that work into it. Then we talk about assessment. How are you going to assess the students to see if they've met the rubric that's been developed for that? So all those things are up front that they know that. So. Uh, then what we start to do is we kind of go into um, an exploration thing of where we go through the parks. We make sure, and, and they get this in the book and also when they're uh, doing it on site, they get a handout. It has every park and we concentrate on Walt Disney World because that's usually where we're doing it. And it has every park, every attraction. And the idea of that is because some of these students and teachers have never been to Disney World. They're just there because it sounded really interesting. So we go through each one of those, but at the same time, we're giving them examples of the different types of attractions. You know, what is a dark ride? What is a rail ride? What is a simulator? And each one of these are all a little bit different. And so they're familiar with the rides are. What they don't even realize that they're doing is they're getting that background. So when it comes time for them to think about what they're going to do. And they're in teams of 10 when they actually do this. So there's a team and everybody has a responsibility. What they don't realize, what they've already learned is it makes them think about, well, what kind of a ride do I want? Do I want that to be a dark ride? Do I want it to be a coaster type ride? Do I want it to be a boat ride? Is it a, a something like Dumbo or is it like Space Mountain? So they're thinking through all of those things. And then uh, we don't have time to do it, but it's in the book. There's a cost analysis to this. You've got to find a place where your park is. You've got to buy a park. You've got to design it. Then you're going to put these different tractions. What are you going to call the lands? And you can't copy what Disney has. So as that goes through that, um, and they learn all about that, they figure out in their mind of, well, I think we could do. And that, that's the way that chapter ends. It says, I think we should. I think we could. What should I do? Those type of things. And they have that discussion with the 10 people. And we really emphasize everybody has a say so. And um, I meet with uh, the four leaders of the groups beforehand and we say, hey, if you see Johnny Johnson is just kind of sitting there not saying anything, you pull him into the, to the conversation so that everybody has a say so that's in it. Then we move to patents because you need to find out if there's a patent on that particular thing and can you pay for that patent or do you have to come up with a new one? And what's involved and the way this and I do a whole workshop just on patents the way that hooks people in is I take them back to 1965 when Matterhorn when the patent is there and they can look at those actual patents and see how they're done uh, that, that Walt did or the Imagineers put on there and it lets them really see the mechanics even though they may not fully understand how all these things work of something like Space Mountain uh, and how it's a, a coaster and the, why the Matterhorn was done by uh, an outside group from Disney. And it was the first time they ever used steel pipe for a coaster. And all those things are in the patents that, that when they go through that. Then we start with what the Imagineers do. They do something called Blue Sky. Anything goes. There is a recorder in the group and they're putting that down. There's a, a person that can draw on the computer and putting all those things down. And then what they're trying to do is when they're coming up with that in the back of their mind, they've been told you need to think about the park that it's going to go in. You need to think about the area it's going in. So how is it themed? And then we start introducing the storytelling piece. What is going to be the backstory of this? Well, it was back at this time, maybe it was the Haunted Mansion or whatever it is, you know, there's stories on each one of those things. 
So all of these things, they don't even realize it at the time. We're just slowly feeding the pieces of information in as they're starting to build that information. And they're being innovative, they're being creative, they're trying different things. And, and there's always some people, that, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work because you don't have, and then what's for me just, uh, and I just wander around the room and if I have to answer any questions. But what I love to see is somebody says, what do you mean it can't work? We could do this and put this over here. We could take this thing and make this as a motor that would work here to drive this. And it's so great to just see teachers unleashed and just having so much fun that are in there. And one I did with a group of 80 superintendents with this. The best part for me was at the end of it that many of those superintendents came up and says, I get it. I get PBL, I get STEM, and this is a fantastic way to do that. So from that part, then we start going into the drawing tools, the models, putting the things together, um, the audio animatronics that'll be in there, the lighting, um, all of the pieces that have to go in there for special effects. So there are gonna be some special effects that'll happen. What will be done? Uh, we don't actually build a model because we don't have time in there, but they can draw a model with uh, Tinkercad or one of those particular things. And then um, kind of the, the last part of it is, okay, we've got all this together. What's the PR plan? How are we gonna present this? Because they have a five minute presentation. They have a rubric in front of them and it tells them how many points are going in each one of those things. It is a requirement that all 10 people participate in that and say something or do something or present something. I, Dr. Cody, I am blown away every time they do it. I think that I've seen the best present. I'm, I'm talking about a five minute presentation that has music, it has special effects in it. It has a drawing that's done there and they talk about uh, doing it. And when they're done, I have four of those to look at. And sometimes it is tough to decide uh, of what they've done. We always make sure there are at least three people in each team that have been to a Disney park so they can provide the input because you don't want to have 10 people who've never been to a Disney park to do it. Um, and then they make the presentation and then I uh, I'll present the gift cards. And they are just so engaged. It is so much fun. And I've got so many great emails back from people saying, this is the most fun I've ever had in a conference. I learned so much and now I really understand Disney. And then years later to get an email and say, I just came back from Disney World and we did this, this and this. So it's, it's just been a great trip. And then they take, those, they take those ideas and those lessons back to their exactly. students, their high school, junior high, whatever right have have you heard any of the does anybody send you the presentations or ideas that the not a lot the grade students because some of, some of the schools don't have some of the video equipment uh some of the teachers are technology challenged and they're a little nervous and they don't like them using cell phones and some of the policies are in the schools mm -hmm. that you can't show faces so that really limits it. But I have gotten uh, some at some private schools that have done it. And it's so much fun. This, this has gone down to third grade. Now you have to change that a little bit in what you do. So we basically say the, the book and our other book that we've done is uh, Designing Disney Inspired Classrooms. There are 45 lessons in that first book that we did a year and a half ago. And every one of those can be adapted to any grade level. We give the lesson, we give an outline, we tell about the attraction, we have a video in there that they can watch, the teachers can show to the kids, again, because the kids may not have ever been to uh, any Disney park. So they show that. Uh, we have then an outline called uh, the uh, magic. And in that part, there are usually anywhere from five to 10 different ideas of things you can do. And then we have additional things beyond the magic that they can do additional things that they want to but I get lots of emails uh, and, and a lot on Twitter that people just say, hey, we just did this and it's been so great. Here's what happened. Here's what the kids learned. But what I also learned is they take it home, the kids, and they tell mom and dad, and mom and dad, you did what? <laughs> you, you played at Disney? Well, no, mom, it was this, and we made this attraction, and this is how we did it. And that, that's just so heartwarming to hear those kind of things from teachers who share what the kids did. Yeah, and 
I, I mean, I can just imagine how good it feels to get that feedback and to, to see that. And, and I, I have um, the first book, the Designing Disney Inspired Classrooms. Um, and it is for anyone who is really in any form going to be an educator. Um, the way different lessons are laid out and the, the connections that you two make to, if you teach this subject, here are things that you can use. If you teach this subject, here are the things you can use. If, and you know, here are projects that run across subjects. Um, it, it's just, it, it's a very impressive um, book and very impressive um, way that it's laid out. Um, very easy to understand for, for people who are going to be educators and, and, and know how to read lesson plans and things like that. Um, so it, it's very, very, it, it's a very, very good book. Um, well, Ryan and I spent over a year in putting it together. And the one that we, uh, one thing that we said was, it is really important to make this not just to high school. Mm -hmm. It is important to make it for all of these different grades. And it's really important to remember the kids and or teachers that have never been to a Disney park. So we always made sure there was a video that showed the whole attraction so they could get that. We made sure the background was in there. We made sure the storytelling piece was in there in each one of those. Um, when the new one comes out, I'll make sure I send you a copy of Ed Imagineering mm -hmm. Classroom. Thank you. Just the workshop and all of those pieces that we talked about uh, that are in there. I'll send you an author's copy. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, you know, one of the things that's so interesting um, to me about Disney is if you go to a Disney park, you can go as someone who's never been, someone who knows nothing about Disney, and you can see the castle, you can see Main Street USA, you could see the different attractions and the different lands and be impressed and have fun. Um, and, and, and then if you're someone who is an avid fan, who's there on your 100th visit, there's still new things that you can see, but there's also intricacies within each land, within each attraction, that it, it literally does have something for everyone. Yeah. So that person who's never been and just wants to see the show and, or just wants to um, experience the attraction, it has a lot of things for them. For that person who wants to understand what goes into all of this understand that there there's storytelling that goes behind the queue in jungle cruise as, as brian collins has talked about there's story in um, liberty square there's a reason why people always joke about not walking down the middle of the cement in liberty square and and the history behind it and the the experience that when you cross over um, from, um, from France to England and World Showcase. It's symbolic of crossing over, um, uh, the name escapes me now, um, crossing over the English Channel. And, and all of these things that if you want to do a deep dive into, um, Every time that you read, every time that you go, you can experience something new and you can see something new. And so that's one thing, one of the things that really, really impresses me about um, your book and about the podcast that you do. Um, so, to, so I don't get off on too many tangents. Um, go ahead, tell right. us about um, the, the podcast um, before we move on to other things. Well, I'm going to do something because you, you, this will be out in March, but the title of this book that will be out in March is Exploring Disney World's Hidden Magic. And for that person that has never been or the hundred, there are 999 pieces of magic that are in here. And it tells you when you go, to, it's done by attraction. So it has in there a specific thing about if you look here, here's a hidden Mickey. If you look here, that's why they put that on the window. That's why they put the name there. Um, 
and all those pieces are together, it actually took me about 11 months to put all of it's a it's a co work of seven other people and myself, I was the editor, they provided all the things. Um, and so many people that I sent it out to to look at, they said, this is so cool, because I never knew about this hidden magic stuff that they do in there. And they say, now I understand why at the Haunted Mansion, those busts that are there, there's a whole story behind that. Most mm -hmm. people just walk right on by. They don't even know mm -hmm. it. So that those type of things. Um, and and that I'm in there. guessing the, the, the 999 um, topics in there or items in there, uh, that's purely coincidence, right? Has nothing to do with the Haunted Mansion 999 ghosts, right? Uh, no, and well, I, I won't even go there. I just, uh, with, with uh, my wife and I worked on the title, but you don't know there is something. You're you're only the second person that caught that. The, <laughs> you know, well, like, go ahead. You, you bring up the Haunted Mansion and the neatest thing to me about the Haunted Mansion um, I love the attraction. I love the story behind it. I think the deepest thing to me is the intricacy or the difference between Disneyland's version and Orlando's version. Is and, that and Paris's version? And Paris's version, yeah. The the but the difference that when you when you go to the one at Disneyland and you're in the stretching room, you're on an elevator that you actually go down, whereas in Orlando. The, the stretching room, the ceiling goes up. And I know in Paris, they, it's goes up and you go down. But in Disneyland, the reason they had to do that, that was out of necessity because they had to build the show building, the big massive show building on the other side of the berm um, because they had built a berm around so people couldn't, it was harder to see outside of Disneyland and see the surrounding areas. Um, so they had to find a way to move people from inside the berm to outside of the berm. And it's those little intricacies, those little details that if you are an avid fan, there are details, numerous details about every show, every attraction, every concept, every land that you could get into. Um, you, you mentioning the Haunted Mansion reminded me of that. Yeah, well, let, let me jump to the podcast. That came about, um, I met Ryan at uh, a conference called ISTE, uh, and it's kind of, or the ultimate in a technology conference, at least 15 to 18,000 people come every year. And I was on the ISTE board, but I was also very fortunate to be asked back year after year. And the same thing, that's the one that we did there was that uh, particular, um, building the attraction. And what happened out of that is Ryan, I always work Disney in some way or form into one of my presentations, either some things they do or things that they've designed. And what happened was after I always afterwards say, Hey, if you got questions come up and this guy, Ryan comes up and says, I, you know, I was really uh, enjoyed the presentation, but you mentioned about something da, 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 da. and he said, could I talk to you just for a minute or two? And I said, well, let's go get a cup of coffee because he was the last one. He just kind of waited. So the cup of coffee led to dinner that night, a three hour dinner. And it was like all of these things together that he and I just love. I mean, different attractions and things and how he taught teaching many Disney things. And everybody in his school district came to him when there was a Disney question that was on there. And so the, the joke around was they were calling me Dr. Disney because I had done all this same kind of stuff and I just gotten my PhD. And uh, so we just started talking and I, I said, uh, Ryan, I've got this idea that I wanna do. At that time, uh, this is when the ed camps were just getting started mm -hmm. uh, around the country. And I said, I've just got this idea that I'd like to do in Orlando and call it ed camp magic. And he says, that's a great idea. He says, I'm on the board for the ed camps in Missouri. And he said, let's see what we can do. Well, a year and a half later, we had ed camp magic uh, for one day and we tied everything Disney into the presentations. We had uh, authors there, we had uh, Lou Mangiello, we had Steve Alcorn, all the people that I talked about before. And out of that came a discussion and Ryan said, 
you're thinking about doing a podcast? And I said, well, I've done a couple of them, but man, it's just so hard. It's so technical to get it posted and make it work. And I said, if you're willing to do it, I said, I don't know what we're going to talk about. He says, we're going to talk about Disney. I said, no, but who you, you know, I, I, I said, how, how often? And he says, well, I, I was thinking twice a month. On the first of the month, you and I just talk about something. On the 15th, we try to get a guest. And I said, well, that would work really well because I was still speaking on the speaker circuit. And I said, I've come across a lot of people that we could have on the show that we could tie into Disney. And then, uh, you know, for our guests, then we can talk to different things in the park. So out of that, um, six years ago, six years and uh, 13 sessions ago, <laughs> Um, we did the first one. It was a disaster. I mean, what we didn't know is you shouldn't let people use a cell phone who don't have very good internet connection. <laughs> and it was about um, a teacher that I had met uh, that was from Alabama and did STEM in their classroom and did a little bit of Disney stuff. So she decided, and we never said anything about how to do it. We just said, Hey, we'll do this on Skype. And so we did it. But the problem was the bandwidth was so terrible where she was, was inside a house in a basement. So it wasn't working real well. And then she decided to have her husband in on the show because he was a teacher also. But it was so small on it. And we do the same thing that you do. We record a video, but we rip out the audio that was on there. And it cut in and out. Um, we did it for an hour, but I think the first one was only like 40 minutes because there were so many lags in there that you couldn't hear anything. And after that was done, I said, Ryan, this, this, this isn't gonna work. We've gotta come up with something better. So I said, I'll invest in some equipment. So we got some really good equipment, some good podcasting equipment, some really good microphones, set up a format of how we would do it each time. And we learned over the first six and they got better and better. And I mean, we're talking five and 10 people that knew about it. We, we had no, I had Twitter. That was basically it. Uh, later on, we came up with, through Brian, the educators who love Disney, which is our Facebook site that we share a lot of things. We have over close to 400 people that are in there and they're all Disney things for the classroom and things in the parks. But um, that whole piece just happened because Ryan and I said, we can do this. And once we did that, we have had one case uh, in six years that we've had a problem and it was our problem that we didn't realize something was recording. So we had to call the person back uh, up in New Jersey and say, oh, this is kind of embarrassing, but <laughs> we didn't record. And you can never recapture those same things. Yeah. So you're trying to remember, what did we talk about? But we did that and uh, it, it has just been a train ride. It's just unbelievable. I mean, just every month gaining more, more guests. Um, we were shocked because uh, in order to do a podcast, it's pretty technical of how you get listed and so people can find it, especially in iTunes. So I would tell people we use Libsyn as our server, and that was easy to do. And then we gra I graduated over and did the podcast on Apple. That has made a huge difference because of people that can subscribe to it and then download it. But we found out we didn't even know how it happened, but other podcast systems Stitcher and all those other ones found us and have put it on their site. And our podcast is listed in the uh, in the top 50, which we were blown away. We didn't even know that was there. So that's how the podcast happened. And we just, teachers that come on there uh, just blow us away. And they will tell us the things they're doing. Their classroom is decorated, some a lot, some a little bit, how themed things for kindergarten or around counting around Disney in some way of counting animals and doing things and how creative they've been. And uh, there's, you know, uh, the number of those that are done are 24 a year. So you can imagine, you know, we've got uh, over 500 that are actually available that people could actually listen to. So that's how the podcast got started. Yeah, and it's one thing that I really, really enjoy about the podcast is um, the people that listen are, or I should say educated. And I, I said this the last time 
uh, we spoke on your podcast that the educators just by nature, um, or I guess, and out of necessity, just have to be so creative and have to use their imagination and have to work with limited resources or within their resources to be able to offer um, the students the, the best opportunities that they can. And so it, it's so inspiring for me to, to see um, or just to, to know all of the ideas that you two are putting out and all the, the guest speakers that um, everybody has put out that they're just, people are getting that and they're probably taking that and they're, they're, they're changing the ideas. They're taking what they need from an idea and applying it to, to suit their needs and their students' needs, which is one thing that I, I really, really enjoy about it. And, and as I said, when we talked last time is the reason I, I reached out to, to Ryan about um, the latest project. Let, let's, well, let's try to get that out there. You know? Yeah, thank you. One of the things that Ryan and I decided to do from the beginning was when we spoke is as much as we can tell them how to bring it into their classroom. So our last three podcasts on December 1st, January 1st, and February 1st were along the lines of Epcot. We thought we were going to do it in mm -hmm. one show, but we wanted to make sure, and, and that was no script to it at all. We got a list of all the attractions and we walked through the front side and all the different things that were in there and just as things came into our head and said, well, for test track, we could do this, the history of the automobile and the background. And then we would go on to another attraction, Mission Space, how you can tie that. And we tried to, as many as we could, bring those into many content areas. But again, just to get that little spark going and think, well, gee, I never thought about that. We could show Mission Space show the video, stop, talk about G-forces, what that's all about, bring it into a science thing. And Ryan does that almost every day in his classes. So it's been so enjoyable to hear back from people via email. And the email is mydisneyclass at gmail.com is teachers tell us about what they're doing. So that that's just uh, another plus for us. We appreciate that support. Yeah, and so one another thing that you were talking about um, that, when you were talking about the, the technology that goes into and the storytelling and everything that goes into creating an attraction, um, there's also another property that Disney owns that has been fundamental in moving technology and presentation forward. Um, and, and kind of a lot of what you were saying reminded me of kind of the history of Pixar and the history of how that company got started and how it started, um, you know, from a computer science lab at the University of Utah. And it has grown to where they started working with companies and they started working with other uh, movie production companies and then kind of had these ideas, let's do these shorts and let's try to do feature films into what now is just a global brand and phenomenon that seems like every time a, a new Pixar movie comes out, it's the greatest Pixar movie ever to come out. You know, I mean, we're recording this in January 2021, um, Christmas Day, Soul drops straight to Disney Plus and, and just kind of the, the admiration people have for that and the positive things they have for that. Have you ever in, on the podcast and the books, PD magic, anything, have you ever touched on and talked about what goes into like on the Pixar side, not the, the theme park side, but that storytelling and, and um, that side of entertainment? Not directly. That's coming in the future. There's actually two or three things. That is one of them. Uh, what you failed to mention was when Steve Jobs was president of Pixar that went bad. I mean, the Disney the jobs told them basically go take a hike. But later on, then mm -hmm. Disney buys Pixar. But yeah, wh what we have pointed people to is on Disney Plus, And, you know, it's not a commercial, but man, if you don't have it, you yeah. are missing a whole lot of things behind the scenes with the Imagineers, behind the scenes with Pixar, how they made things, a day at Pixar, 
all of those things. And Ryan and I are going to talk a little bit about that on a couple of the podcasts in the future this spring. Uh, the same, same thing applies with uh, a number of other things that are in there. Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. There is a really good, I think it's five, four or five videos of how they developed that whole story and how they were just given freedom to mm -hmm. develop that. And what I never realized, I didn't know there was a different director each time they did one of those mm -hmm. things and to follow that whole thing. So we want to talk about that a little bit, uh, talk about the animation. So there's a, so many things that are on Disney Plus that we haven't even gotten to yet. Yeah. So, and what we're trying, Ryan is trying, really trying to get a couple people, but it's so tough to get through on Disney if they're still working for Disney or get them to, to talk, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, but if you can get some Imagineers that are retired and doing some things. So we're working on some future shows uh, with that. Well, and the, the, the students in the class, um, that is actually one of the things they do during the semester is um, there are many things we watch on Disney Plus. Um, so for instance, we watch the, they, they watch the Imagineering story when we're talking about the parks. So they kind of understand those behind the scenes. And you mentioned the, the shows on the Mandalorian. Yeah, the Star Wars Galaxy, uh, I'm sorry, Star Wars Gallery um those shows kind of going behind the scenes how they made mandalorian i think they've all also done it for uh, uh, for in for clouds um but the technology that they talk about when they were filming the mandalorian and using gaming technology video gaming technology yeah. um in their volume that's where they you know that's where they shot or filmed um, of most of the scenes and now it's been so successful that the company is building additional volumes around the world so that they can have multiple shows running um, at the same time using this gaming technology that rather than having to send a crew out on location and a hundred people or so out on location for maybe one or two scenes now they can digitally um, exhibit everything on the walls of the volume. So it cuts down on production costs. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating the technology behind how they're able to do so much of that stuff. Um, so before we, before we transition to the, the last portion, I just wanted to um, say one more thing about, about PD magic. Um, we, because students in the class, um, hopefully people listening, have such a diverse background. Um, I know there will be people who they, their careers will be in education in some shape, form, or fashion. Um, so could you just give, you talked about the, the things you do at PD Magic, um, but could you give kind of an overview of like what a day is at PD Magic, I, I know, you know, they wake up, they go to class, and then the rest of the day are in the parks and other activities and everything. Um, but just give us a day of what it would be like to be there. Okay, um, let me preface it by this. There are 25 lessons we have online. Um, all of the teachers do this for professional development credit towards a certification or salary advancement. And what we found was we, we do a survey of the people that are coming. So the 10 people coming, we had two people who had many, many years ago gone to a Disney park. Through those 25 lessons, if they'd like, they can do any number of those and get a certificate to turn into HR. We encourage the people that have never been or just once or twice to go through those because we've taken most of the things that are in the book and put them into an online lesson. So if they don't understand what audio animatronics is, there's a lesson on that. We want them up to speed as much as they can be. And I, I was really shocked because I figured they're just gonna be some people who aren't gonna do this. And the ones, uh, the two or three, actually we had one that had been to the parks over 50 times do every single lesson. <laughs> And I said, Kim, you really don't have to do that. If you, she's no, I just want it for the PD credit. So that's the preface to it. And we do that nine months ahead of time. We try to do all this one year out. 
And that's a part of, and they have a, a time frame that they can turn that in. What happens is we get them a discount. Uh, we stay at Pop Century. And every morning at 7.30, you go down for breakfast. And you grab a breakfast, and we get around a large table with the 10 people. And we have a about a 45-minute discussion about what we're going to do today, some different ideas and things, and what they'll see. So they're kind of prepared for that. It's a lot of interaction. Uh, there's a little, after they've gone to one of the parks, there's some discussion of the previous day. Well, how, how would you take what you learned about the, the, the and integrate that into your classroom or do a lesson with your kids and right away and they know that ahead of time so they've been thinking about it and we have about 15 minutes where they share that and then about a half an hour of talking about okay we're going to be going to magic kingdom and we're going to talk about how this story unfolds of how the theater is when you go through the gates and put your magic band up there that is getting your ticket and getting into the theater when you walk under the railroad tracks you are walking into the theater and when you mm -hmm. come through there, you're there. There's a, a red colored carpet that's there. We talk about colors. Then I walk them down Main Street and I give them about 30 different things that everybody just walks right on by. I take them into the back of where the hats are and show them the phone and pick it up and let them listen to it. And there's a conversation going on back and forth of two ladies, I'm sorry, four ladies because it was a party line and somebody, usually after I've shown three or four, they said, why did they do that? And I said, think about what we're doing. This is Main Street USA. We're trying to put as many things during that time period in. Walk down the street, look at the lights. They start with this gas kerosene lamp. And then we go to the next type of light that is uh, another kind of gas. Then there's an electric light and then there's the LEDs that we have today. That's all part of the story. And what's so much fun is in those morning things, the, the, their eyes, you see the light bulb going mm -hmm. off. I, I get it. I understand why. They, and then they're curious. Then they're looking and then we'll walk down Main Street. I won't mention something and say, well, who's this Osh guy here on the Emporium? I said, well, that's back in a film that was done in a period of time. And, um, you know, and then they'll, I'll say, do you know why those are only 12 inches high in the window? I said, no, why? Well, it doesn't make a big deal. I said, yes, it does for kids because kids can't see in the window. Mm -hmm. oh, you're kidding me. And we go through all that and that discovery thing. And then after that, we enter the park. Now we have, depending on the park, we have specific areas we're going to because we want to teach them a certain thing. So one of the first things we do is we go over to Haunted Mansion. We have talked ahead of time online in class about the hat box ghost. We've talked about the mirrors and the way that those things are done. And then we show them the busts that are there and the story, uh, all of the things in the, in the queue. And then when we get in, we've talked a little bit about what's going to happen in the attraction of what they're gonna see. So we go through it, come out and talk about it. And we usually have enough time to do two or three attractions because we do quit. We quit at 1158. And the reason for that is most of them brought their family. So they still have time from then until when the park closes, like at 10 or 11, to do some of the things. Uh, and then that repeats the next day. So we're going over to Epcot. Uh, and we're going to do this at the front. What happened yesterday? How can you apply that in the classroom? What can you do? How do you see this working for your grade level? So that's kind of the typical things and we do all four parks um, through there. Sunday night when they come in uh, in the afternoon and then at night we have a, like a little get together uh, over in the Contemporary Resort and we kind of give them background information. And then that night we also go to over to the Magic Kingdom and talk about some different things. So that's kind of the, the background. And then on the last day we finish at Animal Kingdom and we go to the canteen because we think that's one of the best places to uh, have a lunch. And we do a recording of the reflections of the week. Um, the idea is just a couple minutes. Every time we do this, it's 30 to 45 mm -hmm. minutes of them saying, I never realized this. Now I understand that. Here's some ideas I have. Here's how I'm gonna bring into my classroom. And sometimes we just have to say, 
okay, we got to give everybody else a chance. <laughs> so we go on to the next person. So that's kind of what happens in the PD magic. And, and everybody has said, it is professional development and it's magic. The whole way it's done, the way I'm engaged, the things that I take back. And there is a, a small fee that we do to cover our cost. And they say it was well worth it. Yeah. And some of the districts even pay for the teachers. Yeah. Uh, imagine them going to the superintendent and trying to explain that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they get it approved all the time. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, when you you mentioned the the um, Hanna Mansion um, and you talk about the mirrors, um, so do you do you talk about Pepper's Ghost because yeah. that is yes. that's something I have never been able to wrap my mind. I I read how it works. I have seen illustrations of how it works. Still, I can't wrap my head when around it when I'm in there to real, to just think about where that mirror is and everything. Well, let me tell you what we do. We bring a CD case, Ryan brings it, and has a mirror in there, puts something in front of it and reflects back off onto a piece of wood or something. They got it. Yeah. They says, where is that? I said, well, that's under where your car is. You can't see that. There's glass there and mirrors that reflect that out. And that's how you see the people dancing. Yeah. So that, that you know, teaching aid helps. <laughs> yeah, very. Um, so um, anything else you want to you wanna touch on um, before we, we move to our last section? Um, Cody, we'd be, Dr. Cody, we'd be here another two, three hours. I could talk all day, Disney. And, well, and I mean, we, we are such fanatics. I told you we had two condos. We have done 10 Disney cruises. If we have a choice, we'll do. We've done every Disney cruise that's out there. Um, and there's just so many things um, that I do daily. I'm either working on one of the books or I'm posting to educators who love Disney. I try to do that a couple a day. And my life, uh, and my wife sometimes rolls her eyes, Kind of revolves around that. I enjoy getting up in the morning and checking my email and looking to see. I have four different people. Uh, I didn't even mention my blog. I've had to stop doing it because of so much other work with the books. But I have a blog. I've done that for seven years on uh, WDW Fan Zone. It's still there if you'd like to read it. But getting an idea for a piece to write, getting another idea for a book because of something Ryan said on a podcast. So no, I, we've, we've covered really a lot more than I even thought we could get through. So uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a happy guy. Okay. And I, um, I need to go look at WDW Fan Zone now. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not difficult to see when somebody is talking about something they enjoy. Yeah, you have to set time limits, right? Because <laughs> you'll, go, you'll go on for, for as long as long or very, very, very long. Um, so the last thing that I like to do is um, it's sort of rapid fire questions. And um, since everyone who visits with the class and on the podcast are, are fans, um, I like to just pose a few questions and you can explain if you want. You don't have to explain at all. Um, so of all of the parks you've been to or all of the resorts and by resort i mean like disneyland walt disney world disneyland paris all around the world um of of every resort you've been to what's your favorite it's a tie there's two and it's it's because of the content epcot and animal kingdom okay and i can go back and forth between those two i love how the front side is future world and the attractions that are in there. And I love going through the pavilions in the back in the world showcase because every time I go in there, it's something different. Part of PD magic when we do that, we have three pavilions that we go through there. Brian Collins will show you hidden rooms that are in Monaco. He will show you about the culture and things that are in there in the back, when you walk around in there, you don't even feel like you're in the park. You feel like you're in Monaco. Um, and there's so many different things and so many stories. And Ryan and I talked about those in the last um, few podcasts that we did of when you go into Mexico, the story is there, the, the history, um, all the background things that are there, why that particular attraction is in there. 
And then I come over to Animal Kingdom uh, and there's just a slight, slight amount towards Animal Kingdom. There's just so many things that are in there to do and it always changes. When I go on the Gorilla Falls walk, you never know what those gorillas mm -hmm. are gonna do. And when you go over to see the tigers, you never know if there's gonna be one in the water, jumping on the water, playing with a ball, you have no idea. And all the animals just, just appear that are there. Go on Kilimanjaro Safari, you never know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So those two are just, just a toss up. I love the other ones, I love the storytelling. Uh, for the best attractions where there's a lot of, and a lot of different things, I like Magic Kingdom because there's so many different things of the lands and the stories that they tell. Mm -hmm. So the so now you mentioned attractions. Favorite attraction you at any of the parks? Um right right now and it changes because Disney comes up with a new one. Mm -hmm. Um and it's in this place called Pandora and it's an attraction where I get on this zombie is that what it's called uh, uh, some <laughs> kind of animal uh, that I get on the back of and it flies away. Wow. I mean, you talk about, and my wife did not want to go on that. She has some problems with her back. And I said, Hun, it's like getting on, the, we, used to, we used to do motorcycling across Europe. So she was on the back all the time. It's like getting on that, but you just lean down and something's going to come on your back and, and hold you there. When that thing takes off and you feel the water splash in your face, and you dive down, it feels like you are diving down and through that, I think it's six or seven minutes, something like that. That is just the most amazing thing. But the other part of that, and I have probably the most things on that attraction in the new Exploring Disney World Hidden Magic is when you walk through the attraction, the cue of the stories that are in there, the things that are done, the footprints, the handprints that are on the wall, there is so much to the story that is in there and then the avatars and different things that are inside with uh, the lab and things. That is just absolutely amazing. I can't wait to do Tron. And the talk is it'll be 20 this year, but they're all over the place on when it's going to be because of the virus. So um, that's it, Animal Kingdom and the, uh, it used to be Expedition Everest, but when yeah. uh, Pandora, the uh, attraction came along, that was it. Yeah. Um, anywhere on property, um, I know PD Magic, um, people stay at Pop Century. Um, do you have a, ho a favorite hotel anywhere yeah, on property? Our, it's one of our condos. It's Beach Club. Okay. Beach Club. I mean, it is just amazing. We did this 10 years ago, kind of as a family investment. So when we go down there, it's kind of like prepaying your vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, you buy into it. Uh, the thing that's really amazing about it is you can go to any any one of the uh, resorts and stay at wherever you want to. You have your home resort where you get a longer time period, but you can go to any one of the resorts and we've stayed at all of them. Now, I'll take that back. We have not stayed at Grand Floridian. We're still working on that. But there's a place in Vero Beach that we've gone to. But uh, Beach Club just has this 1920s vibe of the way that it's decorated. And the best part is the pool is the best pool on Disney property. When you go in that pool, there's a center section that you can walk on. There is sand in the bottom of that pool. <laughs> and you walk and say, this is not real. This is sand like yeah. on a beach. And there's a beach that you can play on there that the kids play and build sand castles. There's a water slide that is connected to it. Now, a lot of places in Disney World, you can pool hop. Uh, they're cutting back on it. You can't get into Beach Club unless you have a magic band that has your staying at the Beach Club. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that, that's our favorite. Our second favorite is Animal Kingdom. Same thing there. You never know what you're going to see on, on the uh, area uh, where the safari is with the different animals and things. Yeah. Do you have a favorite restaurant on property? Oh, man. This is tough. Um, Probably the most elaborate that I've enjoyed is, uh, well, I'm thinking, um, the California Grill that's just at the top of the Contemporary and you look out all over uh, the park. Um, another one that is over on the boardwalk is uh, Petarina Il Forno. It's 
Italian restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one is over in Japan, and I don't, a Tempo Ito, I think it's called, and it's kind of like the uh, chefs that do all the tricks with the tools and things. Excellent meal and a great show that goes on. Yeah. And last one, um, any of the parks walking around, um, favorite treat? Tree? Yeah, treat. Oh, treat. Yeah, sorry, treat. Oh, uh, I am a sucker for that Mickey bar. Yeah. I just got to have it. And I, you know, you can buy it some other places, but uh, it was amazing because I remember going to Disneyland for a dollar. Getting, I think it was 50 cents. Then I went to a dollar. Then they went to two. When I was there just before the pandemic hit, five dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> yeah. like, what has happened to this? But it's yeah. still worth it. Yeah. Uh, that that's my that is my go-to treat. Uh, this last time we went was the first time I had Dole Whip. And so now that's I had no, four I or five of those there. Um, so I, those two are now I have to have. I'll have to have those when I go to Magic Kingdom, at least. Um, well, thank you for doing this. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for walking us through um, your background and your fandom, but also um, talking to us about the technology and sort of the, the background of the technology of, of what goes into all of this um, and what goes into helping teachers in the classroom from PD magic to the books, to the podcast. Um, this was a lot of fun. Is there, um, how can people best get a hold of you or follow you? Uh, if you want to follow the best thing is on Facebook educators who love Disney. Uh, an email is my Howie at frontier.net is the best. I do check over, uh, each day on edu on, uh, the, um, my Disney class. Uh, at gmail.com, but I do a lot more things from and uh, can answer things a lot quicker at um, Howie at Frontier.net. So if you want to get a hold of it, and if you want, as I said, I, because of so many other commitments I have on the uh, book schedule, uh, WDW Fan Zone has uh, it's either five or six years of things, uh, 12 a year that were being uh, published. There's over 60 of those that are in there, and it's all about. Uh, everything Disney is on okay. there. All right. So well, hey, I just really appreciate this. I can't tell you how much fun this is because uh, uh, in and my grandkids are like, oh, Papa's talking about Disney again. <laughs> but yeah, but when they go, um, they really understand a lot of the things and the attractions and then they understand. And it's funny how the kids now are starting to have favorite attractions and favorite yeah. parks and things. So we're going to pass that on to them. But this is a fantastic <laughs> experience, and it's uh, so been so enjoyable, Dr. Cody. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Dr. Howard. This was a this was a lot of fun. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.